Hey, 42 here. When was the last time you did something nice, whether for a friend, family member, or a complete stranger, and then instantly regretted it? Maybe you let a little old lady go ahead of you in the line at Starbucks, and then the little twat goes and takes the last cinnamon swirl which you had been craving all morning. Or maybe you let your squinting sibling borrow your sunglasses, only for them to lose them out of the car window. If something like this has happened to you, then the maxim, no good deed goes unpunished, probably went rushing through your head. You might have even said it out loud as a superstitious explanation for why the universe just took a massive crap on you, when all you were doing is trying to be nice. But superstitions are usually just superstitions. Sure, we may search frantically for something made out of wood to knock on, to ward off bad luck, and choose to walk around ladders instead of under them. But most of us don't do these things because we really believe they work. We just don't see the harm in giving it a go. Because let's be honest, when was the last time something bad happened to you and you can contribute it to that time you opened an umbrella in your kitchen? My guess is probably zero. And yet even the thought of opening a brolly indoors probably gives you a little bit of anxiety. The same can't be said for doing nice things for others. You could probably run a list off the top of your head of all the times you've been taken advantage of, received a hostile reaction, or simply lost out, all due to you trying to be a decent person. One such example of a kind gesture epically backfiring was when 27-year-old Bobby McDonald was running for a seat on the Walton City Council in Kentucky. After counting up the ballots, he and the fellow candidate had the same number of votes each, 669 to be precise. So what did the great people of Kentucky do to resolve this great issue? They flipped a coin, I shit you not. Bobby came up tails, and the election was over, he'd lost. All he needed was one more vote and he would have secured that seat, but it couldn't have been helped. Right? Well, not exactly. You see, to understand why his dreams of being elected to a Kentucky City Council went south, we need to go back to the morning of the election, and more specifically, his bedroom. Bobby's wife, Katie, is a hard-working woman. She works nights at a local hospital as a patient care assistant and is a student at college. On top of all this, she is also a mother, raising her and Bobby's three kids. To be expected, she was bloody knackered. And when the day of the election came for her husband's seat on the council, she was having a well-deserved lie-in. Bobby, being the caring husband that he was, just let her sleep in. Surely one vote wouldn't matter. The rest, they say, is history. It's natural to point the finger at cases like these and proclaim it was a supernatural fate-induced outcome, some energy-balancing universe bollocks which rules that good intentions should receive negative outcomes for the giver. If he touched some wood and carried a rabbit's foot in his pocket, would that they have gone any differently? Probably not. This is because instances like these are just a coincidence. I've covered coincidences and the scientific reason they happen before in another video. You can find a link to that in the description. But the reason behind why coincidences happen all comes down to probability, not fate. You can put your tarot cards down now. Take the following example that shows how we take coincidences out of context. You're at a party, a small party of let's say 23 people. You're talking with a fellow guest, and it turns out you both share the same birthday. You might spend the rest of the party talking to your birthday twin, thinking that there must be some reason you have crossed paths. Perhaps the universe has engineered your meeting to fulfill a destiny. Because seriously, what are the chances, right? Well, actually, quite high. In that room of 23 guests, there is a 50-50 chance that two people will share the same birthday. I know there's 365 days in the year, how does that work? Statistics. But if you didn't know that simple statistic probability, you'd probably think it was meant to be or spooky. And this is the problem with coincidences. When we're missing crucial information and we're not able to see the bigger picture, 
things that might seem out of place will hold a greater meaning than they actually deserve, because statistically, two people sharing the same birthday at a relatively small gathering is going to occur about one out of every two times. So, let's take poor Bobby from Kentucky. Sure, it's rather unfortunate that his wife's vote could have pushed the election in his favour, but that aside, the chances of a tie were already pretty high. The city of Walton at the time had a population of around 3,700, and with only six council seats up for grabs, it was always going to be a close call. You might also be surprised to hear that countless candidates all around the world have won by just a handful of votes, or even just one. This is why your vote really does matter. It happens all the time. In fact, according to a study of state and federal elections in the US between 1898 and 1992, one in every 15,000 votes cast in state elections was the winning vote, which gave the candidate that extra majority they needed to win. Sure, Bobby could have woken his wife up that fateful day and secured her vote, but equally, someone living down the street from him might have woken up that day and decided that they were going to vote for his opponent, bringing it to a tie once again. And in my experience, just to be on the safe side, he was probably best letting his wife have a lie in. Not worth it. This logic makes sense for all the unbelievably weird occurrences that you usually hear about on social media, or perhaps have even happened to you. But I know what you're thinking. I'm not reading into things. When I'm nice, it usually backfires. And unfortunately, you're right. Researchers at the University of Guelph discovered that when people are highly cooperative and generous, they attract hatred. So you're not imagining it. But why does this happen? It all stems from a deep-rooted attitude of not wanting to look bad. And what's a reliable way to look bad? when someone else does something good, especially something you wouldn't do. And so, of course, the only way to cover up your insecurity is to punish that person that's shown you up and bring them down a peg or two. But this isn't a new thing. There is evidence to suggest that this mindset occurred during our hunter-gatherer days, and it obviously hasn't left us. Professor Pat Barkley, who led research on this matter, says, in a lot of these societies, they defend their equal status by bringing down someone who could potentially lord things over everybody else. If that sounds like a thought process you regularly encounter whilst at work, you'd be right. The fear of someone doing better than you is even more prevalent in competitive environments. And get this, it was found that people will still punish the do-gooder, even if it is detrimental to themselves. But why are acts of kindness are sometimes met with somewhat surprising hostility might be due to the reason we're trying to be nice in the first place. When was the last time you did something good for someone else and didn't get something in return? This could be anything from gaining favours to getting that warm, fuzzy feeling inside. The answer is probably never. But it's okay. It wasn't a trick question. Doing good makes us feel good. Being generous usually instills one with a feeling of self-worth, warmth towards our fellow man, and a sense of purpose. So when you held open the door for that young lady with the pram, what you were really looking for was a simple smile in return. An acknowledgement of your good deed, another notch on your I'm a good human stick. So when you got a grunt and a pram wheel over your foot, you instantly regretted wasting your time and energy. So what went wrong here? To put it simply, you expected a reaction that you didn't receive. And in a way, that's your fault. That may sound harsh, but hear me out. Expecting a particular reaction from someone, even when you're doing something which you consider nice, is never guaranteed. Even when it's something stupidly simple such as holding a door, the receiver might have a whole host of reasons why that gesture wasn't appreciated. Maybe they had to pick up their pace and felt rushed. Perhaps they always used the other door for some unknown weird reason. Heck, perhaps they were triggered by your toxic masculinity. Who the hell knows? And that's kind of the problem. We don't know. No matter how hard we try, it's impossible to know 
how a good deed will be received because there are always too many variables which we are unaware of. So what we usually end up doing is what we think is the best thing to do because that's all we have to go on. Sure, you thought you'd be Mr. Popular giving out full-size Snickers bars at Halloween, but to the kid who just turned up with a severe peanut allergy, you just made his night a lot worse. And probably sent his mum on a Facebook rant naming and shaming you. But what about those times when we hit the nail on the head? We might do something nice for someone, like mow their front garden, give them a lift, or even just offer a shoulder to cry on. But then something happens. They put in more requests, again and again, and before you know it, that single kind gesture has turned into a weekly chore, and your calendar is completely filled up with a mixture of babysitting their kids and being their chauffeur. Probably sounds familiar, right? Well, to be brutally honest, there is no deep-rooted scientific axiom here. Usually this is just a case of people being general assholes and taking advantage of your generosity. It happens, and it can easily make us regret being nice in the first place. But if you constantly find yourself being taken advantage of in this way, there's a chance it isn't just bad luck. If you're an empathetic person who usually goes that extra mile with helping someone, chances are you are a prime target for sociopaths. According to Professor Jane McGregor and mental health practitioner Tim McGregor, very highly empathetic people can find themselves helping others at the expense of their own needs. And for individuals with this tendency, the psychopath sociopath can manipulate and take advantage of that person by eliciting pity and or guilt from them. All this sounds pretty disheartening. And after all I've just told you, why would you want to do something nice ever again? Well, there is one reason. Kindness might be the secret to living a longer life. And how do we know this? Rabbits. In 1978, Dr. Robert Nerin and his fellow researchers were conducting an experiment on a group of rabbits to determine whether or not a high-fat diet would impact heart health. But the results gave Dr. Nerin something to chew on as he would have had expected that all of the rabbits in the study would have shown a vast increase in the fatty deposits in their small blood vessels, which usually corresponds with high cholesterol levels. But they didn't. Not to the same extent, anyway. About 60% of the rabbits studied had better health outcomes than the others. But instead of abandoning the study, Dr. Nerin wanted to find out why exactly these rabbits hadn't experienced the same detrimental health effects as the other bunnies. And what he discovered was shocking. It turned out that all of the rabbits that did well during the experiment were all being looked after by the same researcher. And she wasn't just feeding them. She was giving them love, attention, kindness. They repeated the experiment with this in mind and the results were the same. It was a fact. Receiving kindness can make you healthier. But what about being kind? I don't care about other people benefiting from my kindness. Well, first, yes, of course, there are benefits to being kind. And second, that attitude is definitely not going to help you. Being nice and doing good deeds is phenomenal for one's health because our brains love being kind and in return they secrete an array of chemicals which aid in our mental and physical wellness. For example, when we get that warm fuzzy glow from holding the elevator for someone, our brains release endorphins, our body's natural pain reliever, oxytocin which is shown to lower blood pressure and serotonin which helps our mood. Not bad for pressing a button, is it? So, the next time you have a chance to do something nice for someone, I say do it. But do it because you want to, not because you feel you should or you want to get a certain response. And the next time you offer someone a free coffee and they look at you with suspicion, thinking you've spat in it or poisoned it, just smile, because you just prolonged both of your lives. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider supporting me on Patreon, the link's in the description. It really helps me to continue to make these videos.
Also, this is your very last chance to get your name printed in my book, Stick a Flag in It, A Thousand Years of Bizarre History from Britain and Beyond. The deadline is the 29th of March. After that date, you can still order your copy, but your name won't be able to be printed in the book because we're finishing things up to get it ready to be printed. So thank you. The link's in the description.